Ricky, hey, congratulations for the cathedral. The cathedral. <laughs> there we go. That's a lot. Thank you. <laughs> well, more importantly, congratulations for uh, showcasing this at the uh, Sundance Film Festival. How do you feel about that? Uh, well, it's a weird thing, I think, because of, um, uh, uh, I mean, it, it's a strange movie to have made, given the personal relationship I have to it, and the fact that it is drawn from my childhood, uh, and it's an even stranger thing to have people who have no relationship to my past, uh, liking it and approving it and wanting to have it shown publicly, which is, uh, you know, which is something I'm grateful for, but it's still kind of, uh, uh, I, it's, uh, every time I watch the film, it's, um, disorienting. Uh, but I'm, I'm very thrilled that it's at Sundance and that it has viewers. That, that is terrific. So tell us the backstory, what the origination for this uh, very unique film, Cathedral. Uh, I was uh, a, a freshman in college. I had moved away from home. I grew up um, in the suburbs outside New York City. And for the first time, I was living uh, in another place, another state, uh, independently. And I came back home during winter recess for a funeral, which was for my, um, my mother's grandmother, my maternal great-grandmother. And there were uh, a, a kind of, there was a long-standing... Uh, <clears throat> feud, I guess you'd call it, between uh, my, my grandmother and her sister. That played out in a, in a pretty unexpected way to me at, at their mother's funeral that I was witness to. And as an 18-year-old, as, as having just come back home to a place that I knew intimately for most of my life, uh, I had a new perspective on the people, I think, that I kind of took for granted and the relationships between them I took for granted. And it got me, you know, kind of wondering about how at this moment in 2006, this family seemed to kind of dissemble in some way. Uh, and I thought, well, one day I'd like to, you know, make a movie about a family, what, you know, my family in some way, about a group of people who come together and then kind of, you know, they, they disperse over a period of years. Uh, I, was also, say, I, I will. I'll, I'll just add. Also, it was the the it it, it wasn't irrelevant or it wasn't unimportant to me that uh, my politics started to form around this time, and this was at the the, the beginning of George W. Bush's second term, mm -hmm. in which the country had not yet been hit by Hurricane Katrina and the disappointments of that the real I mean incompetence of that administration just yet, and there was still the post nine eleven fervor. And most people in my family were very strong. Um, you know, they were they were they were strong Bush people, and it was a climate of um, kind of emergency and fear. And I think that <clears throat> wondering how my family got to be the way it did uh, over over a period of years in which the country itself underwent certain changes was really interesting to me, and that was something I wanted to make a movie about. So essentially, you were the Jesse of the of the film through, through all those years? Yes. Um, yes, I mean, the, 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 the only child uh, who's witness to all of this stuff. Yeah, I mean, he is, he is, uh, <clears throat> you know, he's the only son. I, I was an only child. I was an only son. Uh, that being said, I think Jesse, interestingly, I mean, I, I most of the actors who play, uh, most of the actors in the film bear some physical resemblance to the people they're playing or the people that their characters are based on. Hmm. Uh, but I didn't want that to be the case with the son. I, it wasn't important to me that he looked like me. because so was, this wasn't a movie about me necessarily. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, in terms of the, the son uh, growing up in a certain kind of household, being a, a son of divorced parents and developing an interest in filmmaking, uh, yes, drawn from my own childhood. <laughs> so all, all all the uh all the um clips i i i want to say like uh current event clips and, and commercials mm -hmm. were, were those um memories of a uh, childhood yeah with few exceptions the one of the first things you see in the film or one of the first archival clips you may remember is a as a television commercial for a commemorative uh liberty coin 
for 1986 during the Statue of Liberty's centennial year. I think it was a centennial year, I think. Um, but um, that I have no memory of, but I, I, I thought it was in keeping with this theme of money and the exchange of money that goes throughout the movie and having this at the kind of peak of the Reagan years appear, which I thought was kind of funny in a way. But all the other, I mean, most of the other archival footage, the, the World Trade Center bombing in 93, which uh, I'm still kind of flummoxed to hear people who assume that that is 9-11 footage. It is not. It's the World Trade Center bombing and it's... Um, the, the image of people coming out of a building with soot on their faces in the snow is something I remember seeing on television. Uh, the, uh, the well, the, the, the Clinton years being very kind of formative to me because of the climate that was set, the sense that there's peace and prosperity. Uh, uh, Bill Clinton saying we're fortunate to be alive at this moment in history in the State of the Union is the kind of thing that the grown-ups were telling the kids in 1998 or 2000, uh, the Hurricane Katrina being something that I have very vivid memories of. And yes, they're, they, they are part of, they're not there just to be like place markers as a timeline, you know, to tell people watching the movie, here we are in 1995 or something. They are very similar in a way to the, all those shots of the light patterns or the, the shadows on the wall that to me, they're like sense impressions just as much as they are uh, uh, giving the viewer context of where we are in history. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, I actually did recognize that as the 93 World Trade Center bombing. Yes, yeah, so I'm glad. Because, <laughs> because the building was still standing and I was like, yes. oh yeah, I, I remember that That was the garage bombing that Osama. Yes, that's right. Did. Yeah. No. I, I don't know. For, for someone, who, I, I want to say most Americans somehow forgot that even happened. <laughs> yes, it's true. Yeah. I mean, people who lived through it forgot it happened. I mean, it's... Yeah, absolutely. So uh, tell, tell us the, uh, the choice of a storytelling style where you, you wanted to go with an, basically a narrator, basically going, um, telling the story throughout the, from start to finish. Well, there admittedly is a, there, there is a, uh, there's the potential to confuse people because of the number of relationships and, or the names that one is trying to keep track in one's head. Uh, the narrator in a very simple sense, I think, although I'm told who fails in some way because people are still confused, clarifies some of those relationships and keeps the viewer on his or her toes to follow the film. But importantly, the narrator gives a uh, another perspective on the film that does not come from inside the world of the film. The narrator mm -hmm. bears no relationship to anyone in the film. It's a third person distancing device to, to keep the to, to, to keep the story being told at a kind of clean remove. I mean, I've talked about it as having a frame around the film. Uh, because as I've said before, it's not uh, I'd never wanted to make a coming of age film. If by coming of age film, you mean a film in which the viewer has some identification with a child. Yeah. Uh, and then that runs the risk of one making a weepy, so to speak. Yes, where you're, you're sentimentalizing things, you're psychologizing things. Um, having that distance was very important and having the narrator was a way to achieve that for the film. Yes, absolutely. Now you mentioned before that uh, a lot of the actors uh, that you look you look for look very similar to the real characters in, in real life. Uh, tell tell us why Brian and Monica were, were perfect and how hard you actually search search for for them. Uh, well, Brian and Monica, in addition to having passing resemblances to my parents when they were younger, I, I mean, well, that that is, you know, I. I, my parents are, they're both, uh, they're, they're both brown haired. I mean, that's really where the, that's where the resemblance is, you know, and you don't want to have to pay to pay people to dye their hair, which becomes another production expense. But it, no, I mean, in all seriousness about this, I think they, they, um, they were introduced to me. Their work was introduced to me through the very good casting directors who worked on this film. And I wouldn't have thought of them, not because 
uh, I had opinions about them. I had no opinions of them because I hadn't been familiar with their work until the casting directors encouraged me to look at it. And I had people who were trying to, the casting directors, trying to um, put, put faces to these characters in a way that I hadn't yet really thought of. I mean, I, I, was, still, I was still of a mindset that I was going to try to find one-to-one -one correspondences from the actor to, to the, the character that the actor's playing. I had in mind an actor for Richard Damrosch, who was a more uh, swaggering, somewhat Italian-American kind of type, kind of a bit like my father. And uh, I'm glad and I'm, I'm relieved that, that that is not what this character is, or that is not who this character reads like. You know, I mean, Brian brings something to the role that I think is, uh, you have a bit of empathy with him, despite all the things that Richard Damrosch says and does, you might find uh, kind of difficult or, or unappealing. But Brian and Monica were not, um, you know, they, uh, they, 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 it was very clear to me from having spoken to them. I didn't audition them. I just spoke to them and I had seen, I had looked at their work that, um, you know, I would be in very good hands, uh, and that they were, um, uh, this goes back to what I think, you know, this idea of like trusting the actors mm -hmm. to rely on their instincts. Um, if that answers your question. Well, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the, uh, they did an excellent job, uh, um, th throughout the entire movie. You could feel the, you could feel the emotions, uh, throughout the uh, film. Now, um, oftentimes doing a period piece is uh, pretty difficult by itself, but you have to do this, you know, over, over the years. Could you talk about the challenges of, uh, you know, changing, you know, like costumes or sets uh, through, through those years, or do you try to do minimal changes as, as much as possible? I kept a, um, an archive uh, that I gave to the hair and makeup team and the production designer and the uh, costume people, an archive that, uh, I mean, I, what I had done was I, I went through uh, family snapshots um, and digitized them and created a chronological um, folder on which there were, you know, by, by decade. Uh, beginning in the 80s and then up until the 2000s. And then within each file, there were subcategories for each character. So you could see what people were wearing and what they looked like, what kind of cosmetics were being used, for, you know, with what, what, what the length of women's nails in the 80s, you know, like the, the, the kind of tendency to have bright red nail. I mean, all these things were, were documented here in this family archive. Uh, in addition to having the, you know, VHS uh, home, home movies that I, I gave everyone to watch. Um, so yes, challenging because of the number of costume changes, the number of period details that one would have to, to pay attention to with a budget of 150,000 euros, which is what I was limited to given the grant I received from, from Venice, but it never was, um, you know, we, we're talking about 30 years ago, not, uh, 130 years ago. I mean, I know that sounds kind of silly, but a lot of this is, as I found, uh, a, a lot of this is pretty readily available pretty inexpensively, whether you're finding things in thrift stores or going on eBay and Etsy and getting stuff and sourcing it. And we had a costume, we had a costume uh, team that was very capable of doing their work and, you know, within budget, surprisingly. But I never uh, wanted to make a movie that was about nostalgia. I never wanted to make a movie that was about the way people dressed and looked in 1987. Um, that that was always going to be incidental to the other things in the film and that it should never be so prominent that you would laugh at it out of recognition or that because you thought it was gaudy or something. I mean, if I really wanted to push it, I could, you know, I mean, there are all kinds of trendy, uh, there are all kinds of trends that I could have tried to capitalize and show, uh, but I, I didn't because I didn't, that to me was not as, um, 
important as just having a subtle texture of the times. Uh, and when, you, when you're doing that, it becomes not so much of an ordeal or a chore mm. to try to pull it off. Well, in, in, a, in, in the end, you, you told a very compelling uh, family story. So Sundance is going to appreciate, uh, the audiences is going to appreciate uh, watching your film Cathedral. So Ricky, thank you very much uh, Thanks a lot. For, for speaking to us. And I can't wait to, uh, to see what you do on your next project. Thanks, I really appreciate it. Good talking to you. Hey, nice talking to you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.